Okay, so we're back uh, again, Team Live, West Coast, East Coast. We're here speaking with Vivian Zayas as a part two. Uh, she is uh, the founder and leader right now with her sister, with uh, Voices for Senior. And also she has an incredible testimony. And our prayers are for you and your family and so many families that have lost their loved ones. Vivian, you want to continue your incredible testimony? Thank you for having us back. Um, well, I was saying that um, we put the Facebook post so that we can alert other families. And at that point, I think they took the post down. Once they knew that someone saw it and they referred to it, like I saw on your Facebook page that there's a COVID patient there. And that actually, that lady also passed away through neglect. Um, the daughter came and found like old moldy food that she had brought her in the room on the floor. The mother was dehydrated. In no matter of a weekend, her mother looked totally different. Um, so we know that this was not a, an isolated incident. So when my mother, um, now we, we find out she passed away and we're trying to figure out how did this happen? Because my sister and I were very attentive with my mother's care. And we thought what was supposed to be a four to six week stay at a rehab facility turned out to be a three month stay at a facility. So we're not sure because the insurance was paying, getting paid. They didn't move fast enough to get her out because as long as they were getting paid, you know, that's not really their concern. So we get a call that Wednesday before she passed that she was crying and that she wanted to go home. She told my sister that um, if we were hiding something from her, so we're not sure what she was talking about. And she didn't elaborate any, uh, any more than that, which is sad because now we have all these questions as to what did she see? What was she talking about when she says, were you hiding something from me? If anything, they were hiding it from her and they were hiding it from me. My mother who spoke very little English, she understood a little bit, but they should have talked to her in Spanish. They should have found someone to translate to her what was going on. Cause I have, I, my inkling right now is that she didn't know. Um, and if she knew she didn't tell us, which would have been like a complicating factor. Cause we would have, we would have done something. And so now my mother passes away and we're trying to find out what's going on. And we, we find that there's a few other families that were also like us asking questions. Like, how did this happen? I wasn't told. And I think that they put an entry in my mother's chart, the 20, uh, I think it's the 23rd or 24th, where they said that they called and told me. They were calling me because I was pushing them to get her out of there. I think that they made an illusion or some kind of a indirect reference like, well, she can get sick here too. And I don't, I think that that was their way of saying that they told us, but in fact, they never came out and said, we have ex ex this, this patient here. I heard that another family was told, but they were told because their father was in an isolated room by himself. And they said, look, we have a case, but your father is safe because he's alone and we're monitoring him and you know there's there's they have come in no contact with each other but in my case since my mother was going home they basically said um you know she can get it here too because I, I told them listen i'm worried about her getting covid at her apartment and they were like yeah but she can get it here too but they never said they had a covid patient so i'm thinking you guys shut the facility how would how would it be there so it just kind of like flew over my head to think that they actually had a case and if they had cases they would tell me and if my mother was exposed they would tell me and they didn't so when she died we, we since they um they were taking down our post we decided well let's start our own facebook group and see if we can find some other people from this facility that went through similar stories that we can kind of share kind of notes on did this happen to you did they tell you they didn't tell us my mother was supposed to go home you know what happened in your case we never thought that it was like a nationwide issue. Um, so sadly, we were thinking it just happened in my mother's facility. And it, in some weird way, we actually built a sister and a brotherhood with people who went through this issue. When September 11th happened, all the families that lost members in September 11th, um, the Twin Towers, they actually rallied and, and coalesced around that event. So when I talk about this issue, I call it an event because now we have a lot of siblings, sister, uh, daughters and sons, um, wives and husbands who have lost a loved one in the facility and 
now we can come together. So one is to share stories and two is to get support and three is to gain healing. So Voices for Seniors was birthed out of pain. It was birthed to connect and it was birthed to find healing. So we just never expected or anticipated it was a nationwide thing. Um, we have received a lot of strength from other stories and I'm sure and I've heard that other people receive the same strength as well so it has helped us tremendously and what we now think of was where do we go forward how do we help our seniors how do we protect our seniors how do we prevent this from happening we have spikes all over the nation and we're they were even talking about the second wave which I don't think we've finished re riding the first wave so if there's a second wave what do we do to protect our seniors. I was listening to uh, another podcast. It's like the last thing they're going to do now is bring COVID positive patients into the nursing home, but that does not solve the, the ill-equipped centers. It doesn't it, um, solve the short staff people. It does not solve the fact that when you shut out family out of these facilities, the elderly die, not just of COVID. They die of loneliness. They die of heartbreak. They die of depression. And, and it doesn't help their state of their physical state when their emotional and their mental state starts going uh, in decline. So a shutdown is usually the last thing that you're going to do to a senior, which is not done to children in hospitals. Um, because had I been allowed in, even on a restricted basis, I would have caught that my mother was not well. And I would have had at least some attempt to save her life. Um, before she, she became in a downward spiral that she was not able to come back from. Okay. So, here we are. Okay, so Vivian, so before I turn it over to my co-hosts, in a little bit, we're gonna talk more in detail on what these hearings are gonna be about, the points that you mentioned on a local and federal level. Um, I don't know, Dr. Nett, Edwin, who wants to go first? And I'm sure you guys are just, uh, you know, you wanna jump in there. What, how do you wanna do it? Yeah, why don't, why don't you go uh, first, Annette? Uh, there's so many yeah. issues in this. Yes, I don't, I don't yes. know. Where do we start? Where do we start? And Dr. Annette is a doctor. Well, Go ahead, doctor. I know you must have a lot. Go ahead. Well, I do. And, and I, I don't want to belabor the different medical points, but one of the sad things for me is this is precisely why I started running for office. I, I am not a career politician. I didn't want to be a politician. I served as a resource for legislators to explain about how healthcare policy would impact patients. What I observed uh, with the Affordable Care Act was the disconnect. And I wish I had my favorite uh, chart showing just how disconnected the patient is from the physician. And if you can imagine the family even being farther and more remote and how the bureaucracy started to take over. And the problems are many of the problems that you cited, Vivian. And part of it is patients lose their advocate. They lose the ability to be able to ask the right questions. Um, for elderly people in these long-term care facilities throughout the nation, it's over 80% of them, they're elderly. They're beyond the age of 65. The highest risk rate is 65 over and 70 and 80 year olds. They're at the highest risk. They're the ones who are gonna have problems communicating, regardless of whether they have a problem communicating because of language problems, which even get more exacerbated as people get confused, lose their ability to oxygenate. Um, you're, you brought tears to my eyes because I could just imagine what your mother was feeling at the other end. Because the reason that she told you that you were hiding something from her is because she was probably trying to communicate to these people and these people are probably saying, oh, you're okay, you're gonna go, you know, you're gonna go to your home on Monday and probably putting her off and putting her off or frankly, ignoring her. Um, these are very, very serious issues. And part of the, what I will call the comorbidity, it's a technical term, that happens with things like COVID-19 and shutting out families is that we shut out the one resource that can advocate and tell these people, look, this isn't the way that my mom usually acts. This is unusual for her not to eat her vegetables or it's very unusual for her to be short of breath. Um, they're asking questions because they don't even know your mother. Uh, exactly. These are very, very serious issues. And what's fascinating to me is I just perused through 
um, what we call long-term care facilities like national agencies that look and grade and supposedly set up regulation. And I looked all the way back throughout the entire of 2020, 2019, and I'm looking at the highlights of what the topics are of discussion. You realize that most of them had to do, I, I went all the way back probably before 2015. Most of them had to do with the impact of the Affordable Care Act on reimbursement. They had to do with opioid. Um, uh, they had to do with the ratios. They had to do with minimum wage or the wages of the workers. And I'm sitting here and I'm seeing nothing at all about infectious process. I didn't even see anything about TB, nothing on there for years. I'm sitting here going, and this is why doctors need to be in charge of healthcare along with a partnership of patients. This is why we cannot hand this over to bureaucrats. They love having pie charts. They love talking about all these wonderful things that they think that they're accomplishing. But ultimately, what you and I care about is that our loved ones have the best care possible. Okay, uh, Edwin, before you, continue, before you get, get your chance, uh, Vivian, if you wanna ask a question, me and Edwin are very fortunate to have Dr. Ned not only as our friend, but as a colleague, and we pick a brain. So the, w you wanna jump in, you wanna ask her a question on anything that is in your mind, you please free to, to do so. I don't know if you wanna do that now, or you wanna have Edwin continue. No, no, I, I think the only question that I have is as far as um, being able to be told what's going on. Um, now in hindsight, I've looked at my mother's charts, which, which I'm not done looking through them, and my mother started showing signs as early as Wednesday and Thursday, not only the abdominal issue, but I think she actually was, may have been going into septic shock because she was, um, something spiked in her sugar and she's not a diabetic. So I don't know if it was like a very, very low sugar and her body temperature went to 96. So I'm thinking she may have been going through a septic shock and they either missed the signs because it's dangerous either way. And they didn't, there was no, there's no movement uh, as far as taking her to the hospital or even telling me, like if my mother was in danger days before she was supposed to go home with either extremely high sugar or extremely uh, low body temperature, in light of the other symptoms, in light that they knew that COVID was in there, they did not tell me. And my mother um, had slipped off her bed and bumped her, her behind on the floor. And they called me to tell me, oh, your mother fell. Um, but she's okay. We just wanted to make you make you aware of it. So why, when something could potentially more dangerous happened, we did not get a phone call as well. So they set a precedent to call me with something more minor. But when something more potentially more dangerous came, they did not call me. So one of the things that you're going to observe is this: is there are certain things that they will be required or have these lovely forms to fill out about. Um, so they're required to contact you in cases like that. The problem with long-term care facilities versus a hospital is most seniors do not necessarily develop fevers. They don't necessarily have some of the things that younger people have, but those little, little things like that, if you would have had a doctor on staff, someone who's actually paying attention in a good ratio to these patients, they would have picked up on that and said, huh, this is, this is strange someone who's not diabetic and is having sugar fluctuations, someone who now is hypothermic and there's no real reason for it. Uh, these little things trigger people to start thinking something's happening that's not normal. This is not part of her course. But unfortunately, without an advocate, these things got totally missed because these places are notoriously understaffed and they're staffed in a way that basically your mother is fine. She was health-wise fine. Her only problem for being there was because she was recuperating from her, her surgery. And so these places are not set up for isolation. These places are not set up for chronic medical care. And it, it just comes through. Okay, so is that okay, Vivian? Uh, we got Edwin, you wanna jump in? I know Edwin's dying to jump in. Yeah, well, you know, right now, you know, it, it's such a heartbreaking story, uh, especially, you know, after you see the progression of what's going on and they're not disclosing, uh, you know, what is really happening to your mother. Um, you know, so that's see that as a problem. Uh, but, uh, you know, going forward uh, with, the, uh, with the organization that, that you're starting, 
uh, what types of advocacy uh, are you starting to, to promote? And uh, is there an official organization that's backing this? And uh, if so, what types of uh, outreach are you uh, 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 doing to uh, talk to the, uh, not just the, the, the convalescent homes, but to the uh, legislature, uh, both on the state and federal level? Thank you. Um, well, when, when we actually became, um, when our group went from, I would think, 40 to almost uh, 2,000, we actually had a lot of families that were very angry and very hurt. Um, so what we started doing was doing rallies in front of the facilities. So that was like our first, our first steps to kind of show these facilities, we're not happy with what you've done. Um, and I think that's, we wanted to let them know we weren't happy with what they had done. And plus that we wanted accountability because we know now that Cuomo gave them immunity and more than more their attitude was like, you know, we're protected, you know, it was a pandemic. Um, so we were letting them know that we were gonna hold them accountable. Secondly, uh, since a lot of this stuff, now we have some uh, assemblymen and senators calling for investigations. This takes time. So in the meantime, what we're, we're in talks to become a 501c3 uh, a 501c4 because we know that politics is going to play a role in making changes for our seniors. So once that is um, secured, we are going to be trying to find legislation for one um, cameras in these facilities, and um, we want to make sure that families are not shut out in any way, shape, or form again. So that's one of our top priorities. Um, one of the other things we want to advocate for uh, legislatively is that we um, get a, a higher nurse to patient ratio. Because we know that if they're short staffed and then they develop COVID, then they are out of the office, they're, you know, for quarantining. So now you have a, a skeleton crew. And, you know, we heard rumors of that there was no one responding to those seniors pressing the call button. You see in my mother's charts that it says she was comfortable in bed and the call button was like right by her side. But I know when I'm there and I and I use that button to get their attention, they don't respond right away on, on a good day without COVID. So I would actually have to then walk over <clears> to the <throat> desk and say, listen, I know you're busy, but my mother needs this. If there's a way I can get it for her, I'll get it. If not, you know, like, can you just make sure you don't forget? Because so when they remove the families, it's no longer, you know, like the extra pair of eyes that are on your seniors, especially when you're the one who knows your particular senior, then that becomes really dangerous. And that's not even to mention the seniors that don't have family coming in on a regular basis that have no advocates and that have no one there to speak up for them. So when we develop Voices for Seniors, it was also to get legislation in place to protect them so that this does not happen again. We're honoring my mother's memory because she slipped through a crack because they shut me out. And they shut me out who never developed COVID or never got COVID when they brought COVID positive patients in and then they did not have um, proper protocols in place to protect them. And I think that that's a true violation um, right there because it's not a hospital, they're short staffed, they don't have an inside tech um, to do x-rays and the doctor's not even there. He's just there on call here and there. There's no doctor. Um, there should have been a doctor in there, staying there um, for the months that this, um, that the peak was here, because that could have maybe saved some lives if someone was actually really monitoring these patients and not just coming in casually to take a, a body temperature. Because I know my mother must have been developing some kind of a UTI or something that was really increasing in her body. And those symptoms that I saw in her chart were just the, 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 the tip of the iceberg of something that was underlying that they missed. And um, so our advocacy, and right now, um, Henry mentioned the, the, the hearings. We spoke to um, Assemblyman Ron Kim yesterday, and we're trying to get a seat at the table so that the families can testify. Um, we're not sure we're going to be so welcome. I'm not sure if they want us there, but they, uh, he, he in particular and Senator Biagi from New York supposedly fighting so that the, the families have a seat at the table. After that, it's basically develop our website, put in features where people can uh, maybe um, bring in tips or whistleblow because there has to be a safe place where these people can say, listen, this is happening in my facility and no, I, I'll lose my job if I say something. So then they, who do they tell? 
where they feel that it's safe for them to bring th these things to light and we can actually advocate seniors for that way. So there's, there's so much work to do that we can point fingers and, and direct arrows in all these directions, but we have to take a step by step. And the first step we want to do is either get cameras in there or increase the nurse ratio. Let me ask you, Vivian, um, to jump in. There's a tug of war, guys, right now with uh, the local level and the federal level. On the federal level, we have Representative Scalise, who has called for an investigation on a federal level. Uh, we have Congresswoman Stefanak from upstate New York, who has been uh, really going at it with Cuomo with this. We have this, this, the powerful U.S. Senate that is Republican, uh, uh, it's in power now. Gra Senator Grassley and Godfrey are also trying to push for these uh, probes from the federal side. Right now, the New York State Legislature, they're gonna be doing uh, the third and attempt, like I mentioned those dates. Um, and you said, uh, Vivian, that you've spoken to Assemblyman Kim. For everybody to know, Assemblyman Kim has come out with us, with the rallies. He has been very supportive. Uh, also, Ste uh, Representative Stefanek has made videos, right? Um, uh, also, Assemblywoman Melitakis has been very outspoken. What do you think, Vivian? Do you think that we, that you, you spoke to Assemblyman Kim, do you think that they might have us at the table there representing? Because there's so many testimonies, not only yours, but so many families. What do you think? Yeah, um, we're fighting for it. We're fighting for it. Um, we spoke to him yesterday. We had a Zoom call with him and some of the families. And he's basically saying that he's pushing for it. He's seen, he can't promise that we will be, we'll have a seat at the table, but he's fighting because he says that that's really the only way um, that they may be swayed to, which is what we're pushing for is the repeal of the bill that gives these facilities immunity. And if I think that there was talks about um, doing something where it's kind of like a, a washed down version of a, re, of a repeal, but if we if we actually take it, um, it, it, you know, there's so much more that they can do, and we don't want to settle for a watered down a watered down version. So we're in we're in for a fight, you know. And the reality is that you know my mother was not expendable, according to Cuomo. His mother was not expendable, but everyone else became expendable. Because how do you put, um, uh, you know, like what he says, a match in dry grass? You can't put sick people with seniors who then don't even get the care that they need, especially early on, they didn't know how to treat this thing. So, but families were kept in the dark. In many, in many occasions, they were lied to, like literally lied to. And then on top of that, you find out they have COVID or, you know, in some cases, the stories where, oh, your father's fine. And six hours later, they call you and say, oh, he may not make it. So you go from these emotional highs and lows that are so extreme and so hurtful because when my mother died, you know, the day after I was making arrangements to pick up her belongings and we get the head nurse saying, I said, look, I don't know if you know, but my mother passed away. And she says, um, no, I didn't know with a very cold callous tone. And I was just kind of blown away by that. And I, and I said, look, I'm trying to make arrangements for her belongings. And she says, oh, you need housekeeping, and she just transferred me. And I'm like, wow, it, it almost seems like I lost my puppy or something like that, but it was never like a human. You know, there was no, um, no, no, no um, empathy at all. And these people work in these facilities, so I'm thinking, you guys must be immune to all these elderly people dying. But this is new to me, and I'm going to hold you accountable because the reality is that this is happening all the time. The only reason I didn't know or didn't know the scope of what was happening was because my mother had never been in a facility. My mother, this is her first surgery. And the stories you hear are always someone else's stories. Now this happened to my mother. And then I find out it's happened to thousands of other seniors. Now we're finding out that this is not just, it's like a, an epidemic of, you know, a, a, a um, disposable culture. Like they're old and because they're old, they're going to die anyway. So, you know, just because the fact that they didn't die an extra, uh, you know, have an extra year, an extra six months, you know, so it's it's a really bad culture and a bad way of thinking in in, in our in our communities. Because even you know, I'm gonna become a senior, you know, and God willing, God willing that I make it there. If I become a senior, would I want to be in a facility under the circumstances that they exist today? And that answer is no.
absolutely not. And, and these are the things that I saw inside of the Affordable Care Act that were most disturbing. The trends as a physician, since I, I explained to you two decades of healthcare policy, I understood that our senior population would more than double between 2010 and 2030. As I'm watching that increase, I'm also hearing them creating this Medicaid expansion that what they were gonna do is they were gonna take about three quarters of a trillion dollars out of Medicare. Well, if you take money out of a medical reimbursement system, at a time when the population covered as beneficiaries is going to double. That right there, to me as a physician and to you as a family member means that they're going to have that very callous attitude because they're going to say, well, we only have this much resource. So you know what, if, if your parents are too sick, then maybe it's time to let them go. This set us up for the perfect storm. I argue that the Affordable Care Act set us up for the perfect storm for a pandemic such as COVID-19, where we were going to completely disconnect the healthcare professionals from the families and from the patient. And we were gonna have third parties deciding from 10,000 feet above what it was that was gonna be done. And this is the perfect storm. And that's why I fought so hard to be elected into Congress, because I didn't want that to develop. So, one of the things that I wanted to explain to you, Vivian, is as your mother progressed through this, what happened was she developed multiple system failure. The moment that they told you that she needed to be dialyzed, that meant that her respiratory system was bad, her kidneys were going, most likely her liver was malfunctioning, things were getting really super bad. And because yeah. you weren't there to see that, they were not actually relaying to you the gravity of the situation. Now, I don't exactly. want to pass judgment on the people that were taking care of her at the time because they're having to deal with the acute situation. Our biggest problem, and this is why I fought so hard, is because about 6% of the population is in an acute phase of care. Most people are, if they're in, interfacing with the um, healthcare, uh, they're only about chronic care. You know, somebody's high blood pressure, they go to their primary care, they change the blood pressure, we have time. But unfortunately in acute care, which is my specialty, you don't have time. All right. Edwin, do you wanna, uh, I'm sorry, because we did, because this is very powerful, this interview and this testimony. Edwin, you wanna continue? Say a few things before we, at the end, wrap everything up. Go ahead, Edwin. Oh, oh uh, you know, again, I, I think there's a lot of things that, uh, that, that, uh, that we're learning uh, through your experience uh, that can be very useful to uh, make sure that this doesn't happen again. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know, while you're, you know, going through this, uh, you, you know, I, I commend you for being so strong, um, you know, and wanting to help out other families uh, as well. So, you know, thanks for, uh, you know, sharing your story. And we're hoping that the story will uh, be useful uh, and uh, and be heard throughout uh, throughout the country because uh, you know your experience I'm you know thousands and thousands of uh, of people are going through this and uh, you know, our country just doesn't know uh, you know as we fight for uh, the the cure for COVID uh, and uh, you know and making masks mandatory we're not looking at uh, at the senior housing that uh, and that needs to be done in the convalescent care uh, we're not really looking to that so I think uh, you know with your advocacy uh, you know hopefully we can uh, you know make it better for uh, for the for the for the next mother and grandmother uh, that go into the facilities okay or you and I or you and I yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're almost there we're really almost yeah. there yeah so Vivian we usually end the program we let everybody do their last thoughts and uh, if they want to give a last message you can also take advantage and you already mentioned that you are in a process of becoming a nonprofit, but anything else if you want to share? I know that you can also mention people that want to that listen to this eventually as a rerun and they listen to this, that they do choose, let's say if I send them an invitation, you can make it clear to let people know that, that you do ask certain questions. You don't allow just everybody. It's kind of, it's a private group for now. You mm -hmm. want to last thoughts and you want to get into that? Well, the group is private, so it gives family a safe place to tell their story. Um, if they're grieving, we don't want the general public who has not experienced it and sometimes cannot relate to then 
um, pass judgment. You know, one of the things that I found that a lot of the members who we deal with guilt, we don't, many of us did not want our family members there, but we had either they needed extra care that they, they, we could not provide or the fact that they were there temporarily after surgery. So um, then people come in and, and basically ridicule or pass judgment. And that really just adds another level of pain. So we are voices for seniors. We have um, in development um, state chapters. We have quite a few already up and running and they're babies now, but we, we anticipate that they won't be soon. And we are running ads and we're actually in development of our documentary because we feel that if we want to get our message out there, we have to use today's technology. So we're in talks for that as well. So we know that this is just the beginning. We have a long road ahead. So um, if you've experienced something like this, even if it's neglect in general, not related to COVID, um, it, the group is a good group because I know that there's always not just our parents, but our uncles, our aunts, brothers, cousins, um, ourselves in the future. We need to educate ourselves so that we can fight the system and change it so that at any time, any time in the future, any one of our loved ones or ourselves needs it, we're already ahead of the game. We had a lady um, who was at a nursing home and she actually had a, an issue where she threw up on herself and she just had no help and they left her that way. She mentioned it in the group and we found out where she was. And before we called the facility, because obviously she's not our, uh, our loved one, we actually tracked down her son and made him aware of it who end up, ended up calling the ombudsman. So those are the things that we want to do like step in as a last resort when no one else was responding. So that is our mission. And we know that we have a long road ahead. All righty, Dr. Nett, your last thoughts? Well, my last thoughts have to do with the fact that we cannot condone or allow uh, government officials to pass regulations that endanger our loved ones. I believe that one of the things that you have gone through is it is ludicrous for any government agency to introduce infectious people inside of populations that are at risk. So we really need to hold um, these career politicians feet to the fire because they play doctor and they're not doctors. And it really pains me to see that these people were put in a risk situation such as your mom God bless her. And my mom's Puerto Rican too, by the way. Um, it, it really hurts to see that they're put in a position where they weren't at risk and now they are. Wow. Edwin. Yeah, well, and not, I, and not too much, Edwin. We're short on time. Yeah, I'm going to make my closing short too. Go ahead, Edwin. Absolutely. You know, uh, my sentiments uh, uh, are, are exactly like uh, Dr. Annette's, where I think we really need to uh, look at legislation and uh, create sensible. Uh, disclosures uh, that give uh, that empower uh, not only the patient but also the family members uh, yes. to find out what's really going on. So uh, would love to uh, you know uh, follow follow your story and uh, would love to share your story as much as possible. Thank you. Well, well, thank you. And my closing would be that uh, it's a very emotional interview. We know this. Uh, we have 2.4 million residents in nursing homes and rehabilitations in the U.S. 40% of the U.S. coronavirus cases, deaths are linked to nursing homes. In honor of your mother, Vivian, my grandmother is still alive at 98 years old, and it's been tough. It's been tough. And I could see also Dr. Nett because she has her mom, her mother-in-law, and we spoke a lot. And because of your mother and because of the work that you're doing, you're fighting for my grandmother, for Dr. Nett's mom and her uh, 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 mother-in-law and Edwin too, his grandparents or, or father and father, your, your honor of your mother is going to be that we're going to fight hard for those that are alive. The elected officials need to hear us clearly. We're not going to go anywhere. We're going to fight hard. We're going to expose and let you, letting you know that's not just New York. It's going to be throughout the United States. So thank you so much, Vivian, for your powerful awesome. testimony and God bless you and your organization. And we will continue fighting hard uh, for this issue and God be with us because the United States, we need it because we are in the middle of so much right now. God bless you and God bless everybody that we're going to be fighting. Thank you again for having me.
Vivian, very important that you give us some kind of contact information so that people that watch this in the future can contact your organization. So if you have a website or a Facebook page, that would be wonderful if you could give that to us. Well, it's okay. Voices for Seniors, and um, we have an email address, voicesforseniors at yahoo.com, very simple. And we have our website, voicesforseniors.com, which is under development. Okay, and we'll put that up too when we put everything, we'll put the, the, the detailed information and as soon, Vivian, as soon as it becomes a nonprofit, I'm very sure people that are listening would love to donate to your organization because there's so much work to be done. Also, one more thing before I go, Vivian in August, they're gonna be uh, rallies, right? They're gonna be protests, yep. I believe. Okay. We actually cool. have two, I think one for in Isabela, which lost about a hundred seniors and one in Staten Island, our first one in Staten Island. Okay, and then remember my home where my grandmother's at is uh, the plaza and they, right now, they're close to, it's two nursing homes, it's a nursing home and rehabilitation in one. They have close to 100 deaths so far. But I gotta tell you, I work beautifully with them right now. I am a pest, I, be, I began to be a pest to them, but now they respect me and uh, I'm working closely with them. I don't wanna say that they're doing a bad job, but we need to keep, you know, I tell them we need to keep on top of them and I'll let you know, hopefully we can bring the organization to do a rally there too in the Bronx here. So Isabella mm -hmm. is in Manhattan and it's been, yeah. it's been a controversy also. They say that they have 68 deaths on the New York State uh, DOH website and I don't think so because I'm an investigative reporter. I've spoken to others that are following this and they say it's close to over a hundred cases yeah. in Isabella. I look forward to the Isabella rally. Yeah. Uh, both Dr. Ned and Edwin, I will be broadcasting live most likely and we will try to see if we can bring that live so those states can see what we're doing at the, it's gonna be live at that moment. It's gonna be incredible, right, Edwin? We Absolutely. can have this, that everybody in California, <laughs> guys, California is also one of the five states that are also experiencing uh, the controversy. When I say controversy, a lot of these cases uh, that they were forcing nursing homes to accept COVID patients. My grandmother's nursing home, even though they were forcing, they had a floor on the seventh floor they were capable, they had all the equipment and they were able to do so, but not in the beginning after so many deaths. So I think this is really uh, going far because as much as we open our mouths and we are out there protesting this, it's gonna save lives, the ones that are living now, okay? Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Keep live, West Coast, Thank East you. Coast with Vivian nice Zelaya, Voices of Seniors. Thank you so much. God bless you to the next time. Thank you.